Okay. All right. Hi. Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon. Have a happy weekend to all of you. Okay. Welcome again to our uh, MAIC virtual open day for this month. Okay. August. And also we are in the national month as well. So I guess for today's topic suits the the team. Our thematic month is leadership and also the national month for the Independence Day. So we bring our most well distinguished guest speakers that are very much proactive uh, involving in um, NGOs as well as some of the community engagement. All right, first of all, I would like to welcome the viewers, uh, participants, okay, academic staff, uh, MAIC as well, families to our online webinar for today. Okay, and then um, for today's topic, uh, in conjunction with the thematic month of leadership, okay, about the NGOs contribution and how do NGOs can become effective leaders towards contributing to the nations as well as communities, um, we call it sustainable um, survival. So the topic for today is the management and leadership of non-governmental and uh, organizations, or in short, we call it NGOs. So I know that uh, most of us know what is NGOs and how does NGOs has become part of the important role player in not only to the government, but also to the society and also nation as a whole. Okay, we bring here two distinguished speakers as well as like we kind of activists, social activists. Okay, the first one is Mr. Julius Allen, the secretary of Club Gemilang. Hi, Mr. Julius. Nice to meet you again. Hi. How are you today? Sasa. I'm fine. I'm doing well. Hello to our viewers who have tuned in. Uh, I really hope, and especially from the uh, panelists uh, side of view, we hope that everyone would enjoy today's session and yeah. get a bit of insight on how NGO really works. Yes. So we want to expose not only to the people, but also especially to the youngsters how NGOs can become such a good role player to lead the nation as well as to the society. Okay, the next one, our lovely lady, first time uh, we meet, okay, Miss Asbila Faizan. So she's the founder of the For the Nation organization, NGO. So later, maybe we would like to know what is Club Gemilang and what is uh, For the Nation and who knows, maybe college can do some collaboration for some of the NGOs activities. All right. So before we move on to the question, so can you please, um, Mr. Julius, briefly tell what is actually Club Gemilang and what are most of the focusing roles of Club Gemilang to the society? Okay, sure. Uh, again, uh, my name is Julius. I'm the secretary of Club Gemilang. So Club Gemilang is a new born baby. I wouldn't say that matured yet. We are still maturing. It's entering our second year since it's... Uh, uh, penumbuhan or its uh, registration throughout the it's still, uh, it's still a baby is it yes yes it's still okay. um growing i wouldn't say it's matured yet so i think previously club gemilang we are when we first when the reason why we were first formed was due to the fact that we saw that many ngos out there only focuses on certain niche yes. but in club gemilang we try to endorse and we try to lift up all points of view with three terms so our motto is rational intellectual and professional so in this in this three in this three motto that we carry upon our sleeves on, and on our chest is meaning it is just to say that uh, any youth out there not just youth but anyone who comes in club gemilang to contribute to volunteer and also to uh, carry out their uh, welfare program or their um you know, their policy making, we want them to be professional, rational and intellectual, especially when dealing with government organisations. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this is something that we, we really look forward to because we believe Kak Gemilang can actually go far with the mm -hmm. with its way it's growing right now. I think we can definitely be a mentor to you out there. Yes, um, I follow through also some of the, um, what uh, the Club Gemilang has been contributing for all these years such as you're doing like the planting for the trees for the nature and then and then are helping some of the homeless people for the you know, during the pandemic so it is a very nice starting that most of i can see that most of the members of the ngos are youngsters 
that means you you manage to attract the club gemilang manage to attract the the interest and the passion for youngsters to be involved in the in the community okay miss asbila what about for the nation normally what what are the the activities or the focusing role of for the nation ngo uh hi uh thank you for having me here uh i think for the nation we we started off it's it's the same with club gemilang or mm -hmm. i i won't say there's much difference uh we it, it's for the nation is a youth uh startup ngo mm -hmm. our volunteers are as young as 12 year old i see so we focus we emphasize on education Okay. So the reason why we pick education is because I think the education spectrum is still is still broad, and I yeah. think there's a lot of things that need to be fixed. Uh, but we would say that we are here to fix on the larger scale. But mm -hmm. we try to help on education however we can. Yeah. Okay. So that means the folk, the main uh, emphasis of the for the nation is on the education and also the youngest is 12 years old is it so that means you want to develop them into more what i call that um having good skills in terms of how do they deal with their living and then education is it uh i think the 12 year old that i mentioned was uh volunteers I we see. encourage young volunteers uh, mm -hmm. because I think the reason why we set up for the nation was because we want we want the youth to be actively participating in volunteerism. Mm -hmm. However, the scope mm -hmm. that we chose to focus mainly is education. Ah, uh, I see. Okay, okay, all right. So it's a very good one that we also see that Malaysia is still in the developing process of increasing the education level and system as what we see now is a very good moving forward due to, due to technology okay let's start okay first is to mr julius okay as you can see that for the past few years all right um as compared to maybe 10 years 20 years ngos were not being seen visible because they say only, only for charity okay nothing much ngos can be done okay donation but now uh, during our tough time okay ngos have uh, we call that shown a significant role and give impact to the society. So, from your views, from your uh, perspectives, how do you think that in our new normal that NGOs can become effective leaders in contributing sustainable activities and engagement? Thank you so much, Ms. Nita, for the question. Uh, to my point of view, NGOs definitely have already made a huge uh, difference compared to back then. Last time, like like what Miss Nita said, I think I was also trapped in this bubble when I was young. Um, mm -hmm. When I say young, when I was like primary, form one, form two, I felt like, uh, yes, NGOs are there to help out the poor. But never it came across to my mind that NGOs can actually be pressure groups and as well as uh, agent of change in the society to push towards better policy making, to push towards, uh, uh, what is this, uh, plea and uh, cries of the people from below. Mm -hmm. Because if it's, because if, if I think back again, uh, right now, what Club Gamilang does is we focus, we focus on rising issues and matters mm -hmm. that, uh, that uh, uh, what is this, um, related to well-being of the people in Malaysia nowadays. So when it comes to being sustainable, this is something that Club Gemilang, we really thought it through before forming an NGO. It's it's mm -hmm. not it's not like we just came up with it one week and then we formed mm -hmm. it just like that. It's not. We thought about it nearly a year before actually forming Club Gemilang because many NGOs out there as time passed by, they became more irrelevant in the society. Yes, For example, correct. like their, their uh, direction wasn't... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Okay. Their dire <laughs> Technical problem, sorry. So like one of the matters is that uh, their direction wasn't clear and then um, there was a loss of touch with the agenda, the original agenda, why they came into... Uh, the society itself. So, mm -hmm. to 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 my perspective, we have been trying to to connect the dots between problems in the society and with the government. So we are playing mm -hmm. an an, an mediatory 
a role to, to, to we can't solve your problems of course because we do not have the uh, power we do not have the funding like how a government can uh, mm-hmm. take care of the issues uh, with vast amount of resources however we try to do a little bit of what we can to to bring at least happiness and as, as especially to uh, these people that are suffering right now who are waving white flag during the pandemic mm-hmm. there yes. is no reason to be shy or whatsoever it is not a sign of defeat it is a sign where we can actually take care of each other and and i wouldn't be shy to say this because ngos out there right now you guys are the frontliners and the heroes mm-hmm. of in terms of giving and putting a plate of food on everyone stable so mm-hmm. I sometimes I have the feeling where if all of these NGOs uh, around Malaysia, there's thousands of them. If we all actually come together and join hand, and 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 be a third force in these pressure groups where uh, where we can contribute better to better governance and policy making, I believe these NGOs can actually function even better yeah. than sure. than welfare agencies under the government itself yeah, so I, I'm when it comes to government organization and non-governmental organization I have to say sorry but we the NGOs we are definitely working better than the government agencies that are providing welfare benefits itself mm-hmm. for the mm-hmm. needy people so that that's just my two points yeah thank you so, so that much. means um in the point that uh, NGOs are much more having this uh, empowerment and authority to ensure that the movement of the activities and to get close to the society is much more better than what under the uh, government's agencies yes, itself yes yes, yeah. yes. government and that's why political yeah. true okay um before we go next to miss asbila there's one question uh, from miss katie okay mr julius uh, what are the qualities of a good ngo because our college also, we are doing this one um, course, okay, project also like Miss Katie in charge for the co-curricular project where students are doing a group project in terms of charity activity, charity event. So they also uh, learn on how to connect with the NGO. So what do you think that that makes a good quality of NGO uh, organizations? Okay, uh, thank you so much for the question from our audience. Uh, I find this question really, really inter- interesting because uh, right now, even I'm growing, with the NGO is maturing, we're getting more and more members. This is something that we have to cope time to time. This yes. this, this thing is related to uh, adaptation of the current, current scenario and situation. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, how we switch from uh, being in our normal lifestyle, we're switching now to new normal. And then we, now it's already been nearly two years and I think most of us have successfully adapted to it. And in mm. Club Gemilang, I, I think um, keeping its relevancy and adapting to the current uh, scenario is really, really important. So so to, to, to those who just newly um, found any NGOs that we, that, that we know or we know our friends volunteering in NGOs, we have to do a thorough background check and to see if the interest and the agenda the direction and the um, what is the NGO fighting for suits our criteria, yes. suits our character before joining. So yes. yeah, I think that's one of because, the points that uh, I can see. What 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 uh, Miss uh, Mister Julius and Miss Abila can see, it's like my you know, like suddenly they are all NGOs here and there because you want to contribute to the community. Okay, we are NGO here, we are doing this, but what is the the actually the intention, right? Okay. Talking about that, okay, Miss Asbila, you can see that nowadays um, NGOs are not only um, fundamental about the organization's purpose, mean, meaning that not only to meet the purpose, but also uh, to guide on how, like Mr. Julius said, on how to plan for the activity. So we talk about the management of the NGO because earlier, just now, Mr. Julius also said about the management, starting on the ground that the management, but with poor management, okay, uh, it will and also lack of monitoring and controlling, it will uh, result to the failure and as well as ineffective of NGO, right? So how do you think that might be the contributing factors to the poor management in the NGOs and some NGOs suddenly fail, has to be terminated? What might be the factors, the main contributing factors to the poor management of NGO? And how do you overcome these um, problems? Right. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think... Rule number one, NGO has to be planning. 
Mm, I think yes. if the high committee itself fails to plan, then we are planning to fail. Yep. So True. I think it is very important and I think it's very crucial for a team to have a very good communication. I think mm -hmm. that is one thing that a lot of NGOs are lacking right now, especially with the pandemic and you can't go out, you can't meet your team members. And uh, I think the SOP, 10 kilometer radius. So there's a mm -hmm. lot of factors that True. are already affecting. So I think communication is key. However, with communication, I think the team needs to know the direction of the NGO. Everyone mm -hmm. needs to be on the same page. Yes. So I think I uh, we've spoke we've mm -hmm. spoken about this, Julius. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but uh, I think everyone needs to be. You know, meaning when I say everyone needs to be on the same page, I think uh, it's important that everyone looks at the growth of the NGO the way the director or the way the high committee looks at it. Mm. So, mm -hmm. uh, as I said, planning. Uh, but with planning, it comes execution. You can't just be planning, but no execution. And it goes the other way around. If you don't plan, you you're, you if you don't plan enough, if you don't plan well, then there's going to be very, you know, less execution. So I think to answer the question, uh, planning, executing is important. Communication within the members is also important to understand mm -hmm. if you are actually fulfilling the needs of the members. So, yeah. So that means the starting uh, of a good effective management is to plan, right? Yeah. Then, and also the communication that has to be open and transparent because like you said, we have to be on the same um, direction, on the same bridge. Yeah, I understand that. So that's why what I can see is some of the NGOs, they claim to be their NGOs, even they are not registering as the NGOs officially or some individual. You can see also some individual people, they are also claiming that we are doing this charity, doing that, but sometimes they are not sure where, what are their intention of because of the poor planning itself. Okay, Mr. Julius, um, like what we have, um, you explain as well, we can see that like uh, nowadays, especially nowadays, like I think like nearly one year starting pandemic, you can see that a lot of uh, individual people um, contributing to the needs of the society because like you said, the white flag and then uh, the donation and then the free food for those who are in needs, for example, that the individual approach to the society as well as some of the organizations as well okay proactively contributing to this so in your opinion how do you see the situation as compared to maybe like 10 years ago that no one cares what is ngo what uh ngo is doing so how do you see the situation that within this one year okay within this one year there is a very much improvement and also the evolution of ngos becoming more proactive Yes, thank you so much again uh, for this question. This, this is actually something that uh, if you think uh, logically speaking, I think it's the impact of how our netizen and how social media have changed the way we think and mm. how the way we receive information. So for me, I feel mm -hmm. uh, that now is the age of digital marketing and the age of mm. technology communication. So mm -hmm. I feel NGOs nowadays who, who previously had already a matured and stable uh, way of communicating, not through the traditional ways, but through social media. These are the NGOs that right now are doing better and well off compared to the NGOs that were using traditional methods like uh, mm -hmm. words of say, uh, uh, just volunteering in the taman, in your residential area. But but they, they have their own uh, they have their own functionality as well because they are focusing mainly in in, in a place, in a locality. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. some NGOs like uh, For the Nation and Club Gemilang, we, we cater to Malaysians, we cater to the mm -hmm. whole of society. Uh, mm -hmm. So when it comes to that, I'd like to just uh, point out an example why this trend of NGOs have been so, so immense and so mm -hmm. yes. uh, significant in the society now. It's not just because of the pandemic, but it's it's the narrative that um, that Malaysians have been putting out for each other, which is one of which is the Kita Jaga Kita slogan. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's so much meaning than just uh, than just coming up with a motto Kita Jaga Kita because yeah. I think right now, Malaysians, we, we feel empathy towards those who are suffering right now. 
and and with this even the even the app itself if you guys know the food aid app food yeah. dot was mm -hmm. not was not uh formed or invested or even created by uh, by the government it was by the people itself so mm -hmm. again the ngo role right there was we managed to connect and we managed to bring food plate and even necess basic necessities to the people who are who are requesting for food aid right now which which yes. is which is in regards to the white flag movement yeah so to me this these things that are happening right now one of which can also be for example influencer uh, ustad for example ustad abid new you see yeah. he have already inspired so many people so these people are all um, the inspiration items tools and people that that actually you might not even be interested in volunteering, but because some people do it, your friend do it, your your idol does it, then you got that inspiration to volunteer as well. Mm. So in the sense that, uh, in the sense that what I can say, um, if if you uh, agree, sometimes um, this involvement also triggered from others, like either like okay, maybe oh my friend is doing it, my friend is donating the food to the neighbor, so maybe I would like to do something, even though it not it is not coming voluntary basis, because um what you see, I, I can understand that the NGO is not only about voluntary nowadays. It, it is about how can you contribute, and what can you contribute to the society, especially to to improve the donations I'm living. Not only in terms right. of like um in terms of economic but also yeah education health and well-being okay yeah. all right miss asbila okay like what uh, what mr julius has um explained just now there are many youngsters young generations they have they have uh, shown this interest and passion oh i want to be like my idol i want to also in contribute to the society so how do you encourage like from the for for the nation perspective how do you encourage these youngsters as young as 12 year, years old not only to be volunteered but also how do you support these young generations like generation z uh, even like the youth for example okay to have the awareness and also to have the interest and passion to involve in the engagement to the society uh i think this is a very good question uh let me just tell you a background story of how i started Okay. Uh, perhaps it would be, you know, inspiration. I started, uh, <laughs> I started <laughs> volunteering when, uh, as early as I remember, I think I was in primary school, okay. and I think I was I was very much looking forward for Wednesdays because Wednesday okay. is where I get to do all the things, all the activities that Girl Scouts can do. You know, uh, well, Girl Scout. Okay. Yeah, Girl Scout. So okay. at that time, I remember just, I think the first, this is something that I remember. There's a lot of things, but I think it's one of the things that impacted. Uh, mm -hmm. One of my teacher, she said, okay, you clean the school compound. So she gave me one area. She said, you clean the school compound and then I will come and check. If you do it, I will reward you with something. So I was very, mm -hmm. okay, this is nice. You know, because I'm already staying back because I have yeah. full freedom. So, so at that time, you know, as a child, I I was, I was very excited for the reward. Mm. You know, I felt like, oh, okay, if I do this, I get something out of it. Yeah. But you see, the intention, I think that's why, you know, emphasizing volunteerism when they are children is important, because me thinking of that reward reward it molded me into right now how i am right I now I, okay. I, I, I can't, it's like an addiction right now where mm -hmm. if i don't go out and help people it's, I, I feel what am i doing with life you know true, so true. i think it's important to mold these characters into children so i think mm -hmm. the first thing that parents can do at home is probably because I think charity is not only about giving. Yeah, charity true. and, uh, you know, uh, community service, social service is is mm. about doing everything that is right. It can be yeah. from, you just go, like maybe parents can take their children for a walk and then pick up rubbish, you know. That yeah. is already a community service. So I think encouraging right now during pandemic, to get children started on volunteering 
do whatever that uh, can make them feel like they are doing something. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be, you don't have to go and look for white flags. You don't have to go and, you know, provide bakul makanan. You don't have to do all yeah, that. True. You just have to start at home. Starting at home means that you can do a lot of things. Perhaps mm -hmm. for a start, why don't you look at your neighbors and, you know, have a conversation. How are you and stuff like that. Because mm -hmm. I think uh, having a conversation right now with people, I think that is also equally important so mm -hmm. starting somewhere is important rather than not starting at all yeah true oh, so from your point what i can say is that um to encourage the youngsters it has to be not only you have to do it because you want to do it but it it, it is based on your yeah, motivation that means your push back a push a push and pull factor and also like you have to start what you are doing and what you like to do. That's how you lead towards the, the better um, community service. So it is not only about charity because nowadays you're not talking about, oh, I'm doing charity. It's more on like, yes, I agree that social engagement and also um, community service. Even you pick up a rubbish, that means you help to the, to the improvement of the society. And I really love uh, your experience that means you started very early age during the Girl Scout. Of course, during that time, it's a very good uh, environment that it is one of the, well, I call that the, the trigger factor that you want to become as what you are now and to, to serve the community. Okay, how about Mr. Julius? What was your challenges when you and your you know members committee to start Club Gemilang? Is there any challenges that you have or obstacles that you faced before you start moving to the real environment? Yeah. Thank you so much again for the question. Yes, there was um challenges. It's 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 impossible uh, to believe if I tell you like oh everything was rainbow yes. and then like you just true, form true. came up with an agenda one day and then form kind. But but one of the main obstacles I felt was when you only started with a group of people. This is can be an obstacle and also can be something that you will remember for your life, because. Mm. I think similar to Asbila, we started off with only five or six AJK mm -hmm. or community members. Mm -hmm. and, and right now, we already grow to around 250 members nationwide. Yeah. So mm -hmm. so when we started with six, the the one of the main factors that drive us was that we, do, we didn't knew, we didn't know that um, in the future that there will be a commitment stream, funding stream. We wouldn't know like if uh, we can still remain relevant. That the word mm -hmm. relevancy is 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 very vital when when we were planning out and and also planning the execution. But I feel, uh, we sometimes it's best to start small with the people that actually understands the meaning of volunteering and also that understands how does an um, NGO functions the right way for the people. Just like Azbila, I think I think me and Azbila, we we believe in one thing whereby volunteerism. Yes, those who enter volunteerism might have all kind of intention, want to build networking, want to gain experience, want to, uh, some of them wants, wants to try to chip in their business, their business uh, scheme. So, mm -hmm. so, or some of them wants to um, get fame through uh, publicity. So I think mm -hmm. a lot of intention in, in coming in an NGO, but the right intention is that you come in to not just to get the reward, but the reward the reward is not something you can feel, not something you can, I mean, it's not physical reward, it's, it's intangible reward. So the, yeah, the joy and the happiness that you get in your heart and in your self-satisfying when you assist mm -hmm. others. So, so back to that again, all six members didn't see any room for making money, didn't see any room to, uh, to, to take advantage of this NGO that we have. So, the I, I believe the pure heart soul intention is very important and all six of them were humble and they really we really had never had an argument in terms of this direction and go whereby we just want to help people and bring better policy planning and structure for the nation building mm -hmm. that's something i can tell i can share mm -hmm, yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Mr. Julia. Okay, um, Ms. Asbila, my last question. Um, since um, you are the founder of the For the Nation, how do you see that um, overall NGOs can lead 
uh, towards the sustainability growth of the society, especially in our current environment, Malaysia, uh, from your perspective? Uh, I think one thing that, uh, I mean, sorry, thank you for the question again. Uh, great no problem. Uh, I think the first thing that NGOs should put in mind is, I think as Julia said, it's back to the reward thing. I feel like NGOs should, I'm not going to lie, there's a lot of NGOs who are like, who does things yeah. for, you know. So <laughs> yeah. I think that is mindset number one, that mm. if NGOs out there has, they have to take it off. Because I think for the nations, uh, we stand by one thing. Even our name is for the nation. Mm. Uh, we have, a, we, we always say this, from the nation, for the nation. Because mm -hmm. I think it's back to the idea of from the people to the people. Mm -hmm. So whatever that contributes back to the society, you should be all in, you know, because yeah. you never know when you are going to be in that place of receiving. Yes. True, you true. never know when hardship is going to strike your way. So I think NGOs, if you can help and if you see someone who needs help and you have the ability to help, then just help. That is... Mm one rule that i think ngos have to stick on to but of course with uh as i said proper planning and stuff because um in for the nation we believe to give sustainable help uh, my members always say this they always don't they they always say this uh they don't want to give uh, a bucket of water but rather they want to give a tap of running water so mm -hmm. a lot of help uh, nowadays, and that NGOs give, I mean, we can't blame them because there's nothing much that can be done. Like, for mm -hmm. example, uh, bakul makanan, you know? Mm -hmm. so I think the bakul makanan, how long is it going to last? Because eventually, mm -hmm. when the bakul makanan runs off, the food is, that's yeah. that we don't have any more sauce. So, True. we have, I think, the pressure that, I think maybe Julius will also agree on this, the pressure that NGOs now are facing is how do we give people out there sustainable help? Sustainable mm. in the sense, help yep. that are going to last for long. Yeah, true. So because you do not know how this will last. <laughs> yeah, because uh, let's just think. Uh, if we give them a five kilo uh, rice packet and mm -hmm. maybe Milo, Maggi and a few, you know, mm -hmm. uh, groceries, how long is it going to last? Because they are yeah. going to come, once it's finished, once it's replenished, they're going to still come back to us and say, yeah. you need more True. bakul makanan. So I, I think we have to constantly, we are running, like our minds are running. I think I can't lie, every meeting is about this. How do we generate sustainable help for all these people? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. because yeah. at the end of the day, we are just non-governmental organization. So we can't, yeah. we can't can't go beyond the bodies and give them jobs and things like that. I mean, if we are in the ability to do that, of course we will, but we are NGOs. So that that's what uh, that that's one of the main concern for the NGOs to face, right? Because yeah, like what uh, Bakul Makanan is now doing, what if the supply finished and people keep coming back because it is a necessity for people to survive through uh, food, rice, right? So yeah, this is what you the NGOs have to face. All right, there's one question from our viewer, Miss Razia. So she said that there is this popular Malay saying, "Tangan kanan memberi, tangan kiri jangan tahu." Like <laughs> the our old Malay proverb. So I think this one uh, for Mr. Julius because you're talking about the social media influence. So how can we instill this? Provoke lah, tangan kanan memberi, tangan kiri jangan tahu. How can you instill this among people, especially today, where everything needs to be updated on social media? Like, you know, like some people, okay, just give one uh, uh, loaf of bread and then you post in the social media. Is it the good thing or is it, do you think that just to show off or what do you do you see in the social media nowadays? Become okay. viral everything. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. I think, I think I've, not, I've, not see, I've noticed a trend uh, especially during the pandemic where uh, I think this goes back again. I, I can't fail to reiterate this. It goes back to how you actually were brought up, especially in the in, in the family and also the idea of 
seeing it as a reward. See, see, yes. this is the problem. We 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 want to do volunteer, but at the same time, we we do not do it in silent. I think I think a lot. I I mean I do not want to uh connect or relate to religion, mm-hmm. but I think most religions out there. Uh, my myself, Christian, Asmila, all Islam. I think we we were all taught very clearly that we want if we want to help, we do it sincerely without expecting spotlights onto you, without uh trying to gain credits or trying to say that hey, it's me, it's me. I helped, I helped him, I helped her. <laughs> so like, so like, uh, yeah. Honestly speaking, that proverb itself is very is very notable and very key right now for us to understand where. That's why. Uh, it's it's not just about jaga aib itself. For me, I feel that's why when we volunteer, like last week itself, we delivered twenty to thirty houses, family household. We just take that photos for reporting and uh uh calculation purposes. We do not post it. We do not want to uh elaborate much on it. But but yes, there are people who tend to post and who wants to post. I we don't stop them. It's your own freedom. However. Yeah. Perhaps at least blur their faces or putting emoji cons on their faces to show that to show to actually not to, to actually not make them those receivers a target of being uh, suppressed or yes, or being true. or they will be feel shy they will feel like next time I do not want to ask already lah because like mm-hmm. you know you guys give but then you guys taking photo of me and my family my living condition and and to me this is really Saddening to see Malaysians out there who gave a little small thing and 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 wants to show that to the world like as if they done a very big thing for the society. In fact, it is something that should have come without force or without even me telling you. It should have come uh, sincerely and naturally from our hearts. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. That's yeah. We cannot we cannot stop them because like for example, most of the people who are in the technology world. So they need to to share, but sometimes this, like you say, Mr. Julius, the misconception of our netizen, so called. Some of them may okay, we are very appreciated with what you're doing, but some netizen may say, "What lah? You're showing this one. You don't know this family poor." And then it's some something like demotivated as well to the receiver. So that's why we cannot stop the the power of the social media. Also, people will still talk correct, about that. Correct. People will still I, post something. I I think I would like to just uh pass over something maybe as we look maybe please share on behalf of me as well there's this new uh trend right now that people are uh gathering against is uh poverty porn i think i think mm. maybe as we do, do you want to share since the the for the nation itself does a lot of r&d research on towards mm-hmm. terminology that affects po- poverty people who are in poverty maybe do you want to share as uh i think i would thank you julius for the floor, uh, I think before continuing, I would like to add about uh, add on the question that uh, Miss you asked, really. Uh, I think showing on social media, there's two ways to look at it. Mm. One, I think those who post without even bl- blurring their face and then blurring their name, they just share whatever details where they stay and stuff like that. I think that is a big red flag. It's it's mm-hmm. it's a no. Yeah, correct. Um, because correct. they are. That's what people are doing now. Yeah. That's what people are doing. And yeah. it's really sad because uh, not only NGOs. I see a lot of individuals, artists, mm. people like yeah. you know, people who are very who have so much influence on social media doing that. They just True. take picture yeah. and you know post. Padahal yang bagi satu bakul makanan je, you know, it's not <laughs> like a big help point. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but you see, the other reality of posting in social media, I think we've had this whole conversation of posting in social media with For The Nation. I made it very clear where I told them that the faces need to be blurred. That's number one. Because at any cost, you don't want to show their identity. Mm. I mean, you take names, you take the quantity of food that you're giving, you take the quantity of donation that you're giving, but that is for your record. That is not mm. something that you should put it up on social media, you know? Mm-hmm. So I True. think uh, if NGOs are doing it for marketing purposes, because sometimes I realize this a lot, sometimes when you post things like this, people start to notice you. People start to, oh, yeah. for the nation are doing work. Oh, Club mm-hmm. Gemilang, they are yeah. doing work. 
Yep. Uh, yeah, however, there is a fine line differentiating what you can do and what you can't, what you shouldn't do. So that means there are a, a specific guidelines of not only just simply blindly go into the NGO and then do this, there are specific guidelines that you have to follow as well, right? Yeah, because I think mm -hmm. when you also post, a lot of people reach out as well, you know, reach out, mm -hmm. uh, hi, I saw uh, you give your NGO giving up bakso makanan, can I get, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, it creates awareness equally, I mean, but as I said, there's a fine line differentiating mm -hmm. what you, to what extent you should go mm -hmm. um, in showing them, you know, mm -hmm. like showing mm -hmm. their faith and, you know, okay. even if you have to tell a story because some NGOs on their social media page, they are very narrative. They tell mm -hmm. stories like, for example, Cik Busta Mom or something like that. Yes. Perhaps don't say their name, say Mr. A or Mr. B and, you know, mm -hmm. just say okay. the story but you don't say who that person is is and where that person is living you know because mm. that can be as i said social pressure is a very big thing right now and i think those who are in poverty b40 community below b40 community they are in so much pressure already because of financial things and uh, the, mm. some have lost their jobs and stuff like that so i don't i don't see a reason why giving help can be an, can be another added uh, pressure for them. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So I in think, the I sense so. that. Yeah, yeah, Sorry, I just, no just wanted to say since Azbila mentioned about marketing, how NGOs use this as a marketing tool, and and this goes back to the to my definition where I was studying this with my friends back in university, where and also it's a trend right now where people NGOs, not just local NGOs, I'm talking about that like really really well known and 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 has been established since the formation of United Nations, like mm -hmm. Red Cross, mm -hmm. uh, Mercy, yes. all, all, all of yes. these NGOs uses uh, uses photo ops to gain empathy mm. and sympathy from people to donate because they want to enhance their crowdfunding uh, uh, projection and their money so so to me going forward towards this idea of you want to crowdfund is it shouldn't be about profiting from photo that makes us yes. feel sad you know so so yeah. to me that's a big no as well and, and we do not encourage or practice using photo to gain publicity or marketing for yeah. any profit business and whatsoever so as what as what you can see nowadays that that's why some people from our society they have this mindset saying that um ongos are not good in terms of your you know like um what you call that um misuse the 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 power and misuse what your intention okay i show this one pachi i'm giving him a, a loaf of a bread and then showing a very sad face and yeah in in the sense that you want to do something like miss asbila said just a buckle of makanan uh, but you you want to give to a group of small people but how do you portray okay so um maybe like um, my last question uh for either miss asbila to mr julius how do you come up with this kind of spec uh, i call that misconception and the negative um you know mentality views about okay ngos are not into the good leading towards the contribution to the nation how do you overcome this uh, you know like, the speculation the negative views about ngos so that ngos can lead to better society and engagement not only for charity thing i think i pass this over to us talk too much really today <laughs> Uh, I mean, if you even if you give me a day, I can talk. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, I think the misconception that a lot of people have. Let's start there. Uh, mm -hmm. With NGOs right now, are oh they are doing that for publicity. Mm, in reality, yes. I think those who are in NGOs, that is not their only work in their life. If you mm -hmm. ask Julius, I think Julius has a job, and then he also has his studies. Uh, me myself, yeah. I, think I also have my own life and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. the, the misconception that a lot of people have is, I think, invalid because you see, people in NGOs they have their own life too, you know. And yes. uh, just because a few people are doing it for, uh, you know, to gain money or to gain publicity purposes, not all NGOs are like that. 
you know. Mm. So I think that yeah, is the first true. conception that needs to be addressed. The second one would be, um, I think, even the competition between NGOs and NGOs. I think maybe you yeah. can see. Yeah, that's also. Yeah, nowadays you can see that competition among NGOs. Yeah. Yeah, because if you see for the past two years, I think the number of NGOs has increased. You know, and the other day I was having a conversation with my friend uh, from the Registrar of Society, and he was saying, "This, this two years, there's so many applications. You know, a lot of people suddenly want to become a non-governmental organization. So, I mean, it's a good thing." It's a lot of people. That means a lot of people wants to help. Yeah. But competition. There are some NGOs who who are in the mindset. Oh, they are doing it, so I have to do it. Yeah. You know, they don't have their own direction to it. They don't have. Uh. Okay. You know, I'm I'm setting up this NGO because I need to focus on education because I need mm-hmm. to focus on poverty. It's not like that. They are just like. Oh, he did. Uh, he he set up an NGO, so I am also going to set up an NGO. Yeah. So I think that is the uh, mindset that the second mindset, the second misconception that I think everyone needs to avoid because I think maybe Julius can agree. Um, being a youth startup NGO, starting everything from zero, is not easy because you have to do everything. Uh, you are allocating your time. You are allocating your energy, your ideas, and everything. I mean, it's good to have a conversation with your teammates. I mean, I enjoy mm-hmm. doing it because you see how you things. You know, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not saying that the older generation have no ideas, but you see mm-hmm. fresh ideas. You see fresh ways to tackle poverty. You know, mm-hmm. so it's it's a great thing. But however, as I said, the competition is high. Yeah. So, yeah, did I in the sense, it? yeah, yeah, it's clearly that means completely um, correct. Yeah, to sum up, that means like the first thing that you need to do is your intention. Like, yes, it's good. It, it it's a good evolution of NGOs. Uh, like what your friend has said, Miss Asbila, a lot of applications. It's good, but what we want to see is the intention. That what or why do you want to do this NGO? Because you can see the trending, like Mr. Julius said, because of the social media influence, because your friend is doing it, and also the management starting from the planning. So as a conclusion, what I can say, the NGOs can play a very good role in contributing the empowerment towards the NGO itself and other NGOs as well. It's not about competition. It's about how do you build up a good networking. Am I correct for, for saying that, right? It's a networking. Yeah. And to how do you lead? towards the betterment of the society and also the nation. Not only focusing on, okay, charity, giving food, giving that, like education, the well-being, because you can see people are having this, this depression, stress, and how do you help the society that who are not able to survive well in terms of their living. Okay, we are coming to an end, a very good content yeah. discussion. Maybe in the future, so we can do another part two version of this topic because... Yeah, it is a good a platform to expose, especially to the students and youngsters, about the the contribution and the leading of NGOs towards the betterment of the lifestyle of the society. So again, I would like, and on behalf of the MAIC and also the School of Business and Accountancy, uh, thank you very much to Mr. Julius and Miss Abila uh, Asbila <laughs> for you your so time for, for, for this inviting. weekend. I know that you're busy with your schedules, and also I know that you have planned for another, you know, an engagement with the society talk here and there. So very much appreciated for your time, commitment, and also your sharings. Hopefully, in the future, we can meet again, and maybe we can do a good collaboration to to like. You know, in previously uh, our school we, and Mr. Julius and Mr. Naim also have uh, joined some of the collaboration. So it's a good starting point that my students know what is Club Gemilang actually. And maybe you can do some uh, collaboration in the future for, for the nation, for Club Gemilang. All right. Uh, thank you also to the viewers, participants, students, academic staff, all right, uh, lecturers, and then um, for, for having your time. To, to also learn something about the new roles and the, how NGOs can lead towards the, the life of the people. Okay, so before we end the session, all right, um, please um, 
feel free to the viewers to browse through our website okay www.maic.edu.my to to go through all of our interesting programs okay like for school of business accountancy mr julius and miss asila we have four main programs the certificate of business a diploma in business um diploma in resource management and also diploma in accounting so that's why like i said um it's a good sharing because one of our main um courses offered is co-curricular project where students are, are taught on how to come up with a proposal to approach some of the ngos to do some charity even online they have this struggle uh, struggle so they manage so maybe in the future we may be able to collaborate with you on how to come up with such a good activities so with that mm -hmm. thank you again guys and um have a good weekend and also to Mr. Julius and Miss Abila, have a good weekend and stay safe. Kita jaga kita. So, and also happy Merdeka and hopefully that we are in a good condition and hopefully this pandemic will over soon. All right. So, I pass back to our behind the scene lovely girl, Miss Sohaila. So, thank you thank all. You. Bye. Thank you all. Care. See you thank soon. Thank you for the lovely comments. Intan. Yeah.